Okay, welcome uh, everyone uh, to the EDPS seminar. Uh, before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics as usual. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself during the talk uh, unless you have questions. If you do have questions, you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask those questions. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Uh, second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences, and therefore no classified discussion is allowed, so watch out. And finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in, your, in our uh, YouTube channel. Um, that's about it. Now let me introduce our speaker today. It is an honor to host Tan Buitan, who is an uh, associate professor of the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences and the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Tan obtained his PhD from uh, MIT in 2007, Master of Sciences from Singapore MIT Alliance in 2003, and Bachelor degree uh, from Ho Chi Minh City University of uh, Technology in 2001. He has decades of experience and expertise on multidisciplinary research across the boundaries of different branches of computational science, engineering, and mathematics, and has been plenary keynote speakers at various international conferences and workshops. Uh, Tan is currently uh, the elected vice president of the Cyan Texas Louisiana section, the elected secretary of the Cyan um, SIAG, uh, CSE, an associated editor of Cyan Journal on Scientific Computing, an editorial board member of the Elsevier Computer and Mathematics with Applications, and an associate editor of the Elsevier Journal of Computational Physics. Tan was an NSF Early Career recipient, the Odin uh, Institute Distinguished Research Award, and a two time winner of the a Moncrief Faculty Challenging Award. Okay, today Tan will uh, present model constrained deep learning approaches for inference, control, and uncertainty quantification, which is a great interest to us. So please enjoy and expect a wonderful talk from Tan. Now, without further ado, let me pass the button to Tan by asking one random question as usual. Today's random question is, if you had the world's attention for 30 seconds, what would you say? If I had what? I'm sorry, say again one more question. I'm if not you, clear. If you had world's, the whole world's attention for 30 seconds, uh -huh. and maybe you are in the television, everyone is watching you, right? For 30 <laughs> seconds. What would you say? Oh, well, I would say that, you know, be united, uh, work together. Wonderful. Yeah. I like that answer. Okay, it's all yours, Tan. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Yusu, for for inviting me to give a talk here to share my research on a recent research on deep learning for inverse problems. And uh, everybody, if you have questions, please stop me anytime. Um, it's supposed to be uh, very casual. Even though you have fifty two slides, I don't have to go through these, right? Um, so some of them I'm gonna uh, uh, glance very quickly, especially theorems. Uh, there's no need to go into details. Um. All right, so uh, behind the scene, as always, right, uh, these are my students and postdocs um, from left to right and from top to bottom. The, the last person at the bottom is, is my postdoc who just uh, left uh, back to his country. And uh, I appreciate the, the funding from DOE and NSF and a couple of, of, their, of um, other companies and, and organizations. Okay, so my, my main interest, uh, my main interest on uh, inverse problem. Um, optimization and UQ. So let me actually give you a very quick just introduction on a couple of problems that I have been working before. So the one that I've shown you here is the uh, uh, electromagnetic scattering problem. The one, the movie that I show you here is showing the electromagnetic scattering from half of the aircraft. So uh, the forward problem, you are given the shape, right, or the material property, uh, and you just solve for the electromagnetic uh, waves or, or field over the domain of interest. 
Um, that's the fourth problem. I think everybody know. Basically, you solve PDEs. The inverse problem is, is more difficult. Um, in the inverse problem, you have a measurement that's a few point. I'm thinking about radar, right? You send the radar, and the radar sees some object reflects, and then you can measure the radar as a few points, right? In times or in space, right? Uh, question: That's can you reconstruct the object or not? Right, and you have to take into account the fact that the data is limited. It's also due to the limitation of manufacturing process. Your measuring device is uh, limited in the accuracy. How, how how can you reconstruct the object, right? And for us, that's not the only question that we want to ad address. Uh, we address uh, a little bit more. Uh, we not only give a solution what the object should look like, but also what the uncertainty associated with our solution, right? Especially if something that more is important for decision making, right? Something that actually can have a, you know, big consequence. You need to know what the uncertainty uncertainty associated with your your solutions, and we want to do so in a large scale setting. Uh, okay, so the the next application is a seismic wave propagation. So this is a Japan earthquake that we the forward simulation that I show you here. When you have the earthquakes, and if you assume that you know the earth materials, then um, um, and then you can actually solve, solve the earth, uh, um, waves, right? um, earthquake wave propagation inside the earth like I'm showing you here, right? For us, we just use the uh, elasticity equations and, and that's quite, quite uh, um, um, standard uh, and it's difficult. Um, so the, the, the inverse problem is more difficult in, in the sense that you have measurements, right? You put the seismometer, listen to the earth movement at few points or many points in the US, you, we cover quite well, right? There's a, a project where you have about, you know, 500 or 700 centimeter, you move it around the US, listen to the earth. And okay, so after you listen to the earth, you measure the displacement of the earth. Question is that, can you image the interior? What is the material properties, right? Where's the fault? Especially you guys, most of you, I, mean, I think most of you are here in California, uh, earthquake is really important. Of course, we don't claim that we can predict the earthquakes, but if we have some, you know, uh, um, idea on how the earth, uh, uh, the earth structure look like, where the fall is, and what is the possibility, right, that the earthquakes can happen in the futures. That's uh, that's important, and more importantly, we also can you know design houses and and put some code that you know many houses or buildings need to satisfy for the particular regions, uh, right, that is close to the earth's uh, epicenter, for example. And again, um, the measurements are limited and uh, um, only accompany with noises or error. The question is that can you actually invert for the material of the earth, uh, image inside the earth. So this is another one, contaminant flow that I'm showing you here. So W is, is uh, concentration. You can think of that way. U is the initial uh, concentration. For example, this is U uh, at the initial conditions and over time it's actually come back and, and, and it is fused. Uh, um, we only can have measurements at in time at a few points. For example, I can measure the uh, concentration of the pollution at a couple of points here. Question is that what is where the con pollution come from, right? So that we can chase company or whoever organization put the pollution uh, right uh, in inside the water or whatever. So we this is this is kind of important. Um, or you know, if you're in a city, if the air is polluted, where does it come from? So it, it, you can think of that way. And this is another English problem because you only have a measure, limited measurement of the concentration at the final time, for example, but if we want to actually go back, right? Backward in time to find what is the, the concentration distribution initially. Okay, um, another example, okay, maybe this is, this is the easiest one, heat conduction um, uh, problem, uh, everybody knows. So if you can measure the, the temperature on the outside of the film, what, what, is it, what is the material, right? Again, the material is yield that we're talking here. So what I'm showing you so far, there's different type of uh, inverse problem. This, the first one, the electromagnetic scattering problem is a nonlinear, right? The earthquakes also nonlinear. This is a linear inverse problem because in, in, you invert for the initial conditions. This is again, nonlinear problem for heat condition. Okay, just a couple of problems. There's many, many, many more uh, inverse problem in, in reality. So maybe perhaps the, the one that closer to everybody is like ultrasound, CT scan, radar, and so on and so forth. These are inverse problems. All right, so what are the challenges uh, uh, with uh, with associated with English problems. So what I'm going to show you a very simple thing, just to put us into perspective. Let's say we want to do with 
uh, to solve the um, deterministic optimization problem, right? To figure out the um, the inverse solution, right? So so G here basically what it, it does is that okay, if you give me U, I can solve for the solution with your concentration, and then I try to see if my con concentration match the observation or not, right? And and if you do inverse problem, you know it's it's, it's well posed, it's in ill posed, sorry, <laughs> because the measurement is limited, right? Uh, so use G here is a map from what from U, which is very high dimensional space. It can be infinite dimensional space. For us, it's, it, it is infinite dimensional space because it's a spatial distribution, right? Spatially distributed by parameters, and the observation is actually finite. So you see that the map from infinite or very large dimension to small dimension, it does not have the invert, uh, um, right? It doesn't have an inverse. Uh, and we know that the new space can be big or small and so on and so forth. The more interesting problem in the uh, inverse problem setting is that uh, the stability, right? Uh, so, suppose that you can get this, so um, you can solve inverse problem. You want the, your solution actually uh, uh, not sensitive to the noise, right? That's that's important because otherwise a little bit of noise in the data is gonna blow up uh, the whole solution and we get uh, garbage. All right, so to, to, in order to deal with that situation, typically you have to add some regularization or the prior, if you're Bayesian uh, inverse problem, you have to add them prior um, or inverse problem. The, the main point is to make it, it well posed so that the solution is unique and the, and the solution depend continuously on, on the data, which is why I observe here. And what you can see here, right? If you haven't worked with inverse problem before, it's a very easy idea, right? This is thick enough, but what is it, right? It's just add a parabola because you know that you know, if there's a parabola, then then there's a unique, if a good parabola that you have to solve for the minimizer, right? Then you know that there's a unique solutions, and we know that this is not a good one because of due to the um, ill posedness. So you just simply add a parabola here to make it well 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 posed, right? So that's that's a key idea behind uh, Tikhonov and also Gaussian's prior, if you if you wish. All right. So the the um, what are the challenges with the inverse problem? The first is the high dimensional state, uh, the W. So this is associated, um, notice that, right? If you haven't worked with the inverse problem before, this is how we I understand about inverse problem. If the forward equation, you solve only one. If you know the boundary condition, you know initial condition, you solve for, for W. You solve it once, so that's it, right? Inverse problem is nothing more than solving the forward problem many times, right? So now that becomes important because if each of the you know, forward solution is very expensive, uh, the whole the whole the whole inverse uh, uh, procedure is actually very expensive. So that's that's one of the the first challenge which we may not see in 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 the uh, uh, forward problem, right? We don't really see. Right? If you solve very large scale problem, I'm sure at, at national lab you solve in a real large scale problem, solving one on really expensive. Now if you solve it many times, that's almost impractical, right? So we have to deal with that issue. A second issue is high dimensional parameter space, U. So either you do deterministically by optimization in high dimensional right, uh, space, or you do Bayesian. If you do Bayesian, you have to assemble, right? You have to assemble the posterior distribution in high dimensional space. And we know, we know that there's a curved dimensionality. Um, a the curve dimensionality basically say that as the dimension goes, right, it grows, the cost grows uh, exponentially. So you have we have to deal with that issues, right? Uh, that you may not we may not see if we solve a forward problem. All right. The last last uh, challenge is the high dimensional data, like the earthquakes problem that I showed you before. We have measurements of the the movement of the Earth every you know millisecond or so, and we can have terabytes of data in, in one second or one millisecond. Questions that how you can deal with that because we know right computing system is not is not uh, is not compute bound but but memory bound. So if if the, the memory is limited, which we do, uh, if we have a lot, a huge amount of data, we have problem with I/O, and I/O can be make things very slow. So these are three challenges that we have to deal with. Um, and over the years, we we develop many methods doing dealing different issues. So what I'm going to do uh, today is is uh, focus on one particular aspect, right? So we're not going to do sampling problem. We're we're going to ignore the high dimensionality. Uh, um, um, of the data as well. We're going to try to solve the, the inverse problem um, in which sense. We're going to try to solve the inverse problem using machine learning. And the way that we do is that we're not going to use machine learning in the, in the way that, you know, in the computer science community. That is, we're not, we're not going to use it directly, right? Because we know for science and engineering problem, the data is limited. Right? So we don't have a, a regime where you have a huge amount of data so that you can train the, the neural network, for example. We have a limited data and a noisy data. Questions that can you actually learn the inverse problem? 
And in order to do that, we have to we have to encode the physics, right, and encode the the uh, underlying uh, problem into the training. So that that's the key goal for 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 today. And in order to achieve that goal, I'm gonna do uh, two ways. Right? I'm gonna do purely data driven, but right? just data driven deep learning, just completely exactly or exactly what machine um, uh, computer science give us, right? Deep learning training, so on and so forth, just data only. And I'm gonna show you. Uh, how we learn inverse map and forward map at, at the same time or or independently and you're gonna see how the results look like. And on the right side here, we're gonna we're gonna encode the, the underlying mathematical model inside the, the training uh, process, right? In, inside the deep learning process. Um, the question is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna show you again how to learn the inverse map you constrained by the forward map and learn the inverse map using and also it's an uncertainty. So this is just uh, you know um, our uh, some of the effort that we're going to share with you. Um, so let me start with the first attempt. So uh, in this case, we're going to do with pure data um, uh, deep learning approach, and we're going to do so for both forward and inverse uh, problem. So to put ourselves on on the same page, especially notations, NT here is the number of training uh, data. Um, U little U remember that uh, the lower K uses the parameters. So capital U um, is, is the uh, each column that capital U is one instant of U. By the way, we're gonna look in, in a finite dimensional setting, right? So you have N, N T instant of the uh, uh, parameters, right? Um, and then we also have observation corresponding to parameters. So that, this is what I assume that we have. So uh, together U and, and, and Y, or Y and U is a training data set. So that's that notation. And the norm here, unless otherwise stated, it's just a Euclidean, Euclidean norm for the vectors or Frobenius norm for matrices, uh, for simplicity. And another notation that we're gonna use throughout the, the, the talk is that phi here, the first argument is input and the second argument is a weight and biases. So this is a deep neural net, okay? So um, the first naive deep learning net uh, um, that we're gonna do is to, to do this, right? We want to learn the different net that map from the, the data to the parameter. That's in, that's inverse map, right? The forward map is to take the parameter and give you the observation. The inverse map is from observation and try to get back to the uh, uh, the parameters. Okay, so this is the first term is, is trying to learn the inverse map. Of course, we know that's not going to be working well because it's a uh, post. So we, we the, the the obvious one, or you know, it's not shouldn't say it's obvious, but it's a naive way to put the L two regularization for both the way and biases, right? Um, it, it's just for the sake of the discussions. All right, if you do that, well, what do you get? Uh, you you immediately can can get something, but unfortunately, we cannot do quantum linear problem. In order to get insight into the the ability of the deep learning, right, and what or what learning deep learning can do, we're gonna simplify things, right, so that we can see things better analytically. So I'm gonna assume that the 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 problem is now a linear inverse problem, and we also assume that linear neural network, right, in the sense that the map from the input to to the um, uh, from the uh, to the, from the observation, which is the input, to the output, which is the U, is, is linear, right? You can you can do that with uh, uh, ReLU, right? Uh, so so that's, that is uh, no problem. Okay, so linear inverse problem, linear neural network, what can you do? So you can solve, you can solve the optimization, this optimization problem, um, sorry, what is it here? You can solve this optimization problem um, uh, analytically, and this is the solution for the, the weight and biases analytically, and this is your, your um, inverse solution, uh, right? Uh, the problem is that if you look at here, I mean, we can write it down. Everybody can write it, uh, in, uh, in in this uh, talk. Everybody can do it. The question is, what is it here? I, mean, I can, I don't know, right? It's not uh, interpretable for, for me at least, right? Okay, so so the the the, the message is, is 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 the first message that it's not clear what it, it does, but it is it can give a solution. All right, so that's it to learn the inverse map directly. So the, the second approach that I'm gonna show you now is to learn through the autoencoder technique, right? If you do, I know Jun Su and many of you do model reduction, which I also did when I was in my, my PhD and, and also recently. Um, again, um, the, 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 the message you hear, right? All the problem is to, to map from the data. So look at this, this is the data, right? And this is the observation. So this is an inverse map that we're gonna learn, but we don't want to learn that alone. We want to learn it with the forward, right? You, we not only learn the inverse map, but we, but we also want to learn the forward map at the same time. So, and, and this is, you know, if you look at out encoder, this is this is out of encoder, right? Nothing more than that. The only difference is that we don't have the latent variable. We actually force the latent variable to be the, the, the parameter. So observation to parameter, parameter back to observation. So this 
allow it to learn both simultaneously the, the, the inverse and the forward at the same time, right? One actually realize the others. Of course, right? You can do the other way around as well. That is parameter to observation and to parameter, which we're gonna show some result on that as well, but not shown here in, in the pictures. Okay, so the, the idea is still the same. We want to learn the autoencoder, right? Such that it's metadata because the data coming in go through the encoder and go back to go through the decoder and back to the observation, right? And the latent variable is parameter. That, that's important. All right. So uh, we regularized um, by uh, by this um, fact, right? The, the fact that the latent variable is, is uh, the uh, um, the parameter is important, and we want that we want to ensure that we want to enforce that thing. And one way to import that is to make sure that then the encoder, when it go from the observation to parameter, is to match the data that we have. Okay. So uh, what we're going to do for the previous way, naive neural network, and this is basically we saw we want to learn a lot of inverse problem. We have a lot of inverse problem, then we want to learn the map, right? Okay. So let's let maybe give some example. I think enough to talk about purely data driven. Let's give us some some example. Very simple example. Relu uh, activation functions. The parameter, the dimension of u, is uh, about you know four thousand, uh, you know fourteen hundred. I'm sorry, one thousand four hundred. And you know um, the key the here is that we use a lot of data. So the data way more than the number of parameter. That that's important that you you can see, right? So basically, uh, you have a uh, 50,000 pair of inverse problem that you already know, right? For us, it's, it's easy, which is, you know, uh, 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 synthetic, right? It is synthetic, we can do it, but in reality, we may not have. All right, so can can it learn or not with purely data-driven? And when when you see parameter data to parameter, what, what we mean is that the autoencoder architecture, right? From parameter to, to data and data back to parameter, and this is the reverse one. And the true parameter is this. This is a heat conduction problem. And this is the decoder estimation of the true parameters, and it's the decoder estimation of true parameter for the other technique um, um, uh, architecture as well. Um, and um, as you can see, right, these are these are for I forgot to mention these are for when you measure the 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 full domain, right? You measure observation everywhere. This you measure observation on the battery only, and you know you see this it's, it's pretty good, right? It, we, even with less number of data, but because the the measurement, I'm sorry, but the, the, the amount of data is so much that you have 50,000. So it's not surprised that both of them do quite uh, well, right? Equally. Um, all right. So I actually give you a few numbers so that you can have a better feeling. Okay. Remember that alpha is the regularization parameters. The this, uh, first two columns are the full data. So, uh, and the battery data is the second case where we use the, right, these two to, to do inverse problem differently. And uh, notice that you know this is the uh, out on encoder technology, so you can actually not only estimate the parameters, but you can you can also learn the state, the solution at the same time simultaneously. Okay, so as you increase the the, the regularization parameter, remember that you force the latent variable to either match, so this one to match the data. The, the more you do, it seems like you get better results, right? The battery data and full data doesn't seem to be much difference. Now. If you look at the other reverse architectures, same same thing happens. But remember that inverse problem is what we care about. And and for this architecture, we don't know, right? This is a pure data driven approach. They use the same data. This approach somehow actually better, which we we don't understand. And and that's another the problem with pure data driven. When you get you get what you get, right? Um, and it's hard. It's I don't know, but you can can, can some of you can help. And that exactly um, the motivation for the, the following method that I'm going to talk about later. So this is for 3D. The previous problem with 2D, now we have 3Ds. Uh, and you see, right, at the dimension increase with the same amount of data, now the error is much higher. Even though you know, the reverse architecture is actually half of the, the error, but it's still very high. Okay. So um, so the first approach that I have shown you for the take-home message for the purely data-driven uh, deep learning approach is the following. It may not be new, trivial, interpretable, uh, interpretable, right? So it's, it's 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 harder to understand what is going on behind the scene. Um, at least for me, it's not clear. And it needs a massive amount of data in order to be reasonably uh, accurate. And that's what we observe. And we want to share with you. And I think most of you uh, understand that as well. So the second approach is is uh, is an effort to to combine reduced learning model and deep learning, right? To learn the forward and and and, and inverse problem at the same time. So, uh, 
this is uh, the first effort that we try in, in the sense that we know the reduced norm model keep the physics, right? But it's have error. Young Su can talk to you about tell you about that. He, he worked on model reduction before. Um, so we want to keep the physics, but at the same time, we want to increase the accuracy of the, the ROM and reduce the model. So the the um, the obvious idea is that okay, how about this? I'm gonna learn the error between the true solutions and the reduced solution, right? And we use an an, uh, an error estimator to estimate the error, and from that. From that, we're gonna learn, right? You see, that's the reducing the model, and uh, this is the error. This is the the multiplication, multiple, you know, multiplicative neural network. So there's two neural networks here. One learned about the other, learned the, the actual uh, error, and that's actually help uh, learn uh, better. Okay, so you have when you have two net network there, you uh, you just simply you know optimize both of the uh, um, weight biases for both networks at the same time. And uh, the key, remember that the key for us is to, to solve, right? When you train a network, you're gonna replace, you're gonna replace the forward model with the neural network, the reducer model, reducer model plus neural network, and you don't, you don't need to solve the full forward problem for anymore, but just reduce model, right? So, so that's, that's the key. All right, so let, let's, let's see some results. This is um, the uh, heat conduction problem 2D again. Um, this is a high fidelity model inverse result. So this is just, you know, inverse, straight inverse from standard classical inverse deterministic. And this is the reducing model without doing anything, just using reducing the model. And this is the, the corrected, remember the reducing the model plus deep learning. And you see that we get better, right? Way better inverse solution. And you may ask, how about just you purely data driven to learn the inverse problem? And this is what you get, right? With the same amount of data, um, you get worse results. And for, 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 for your information, this is a little bit more detail on what to do on these about, right? Full model, time, the reducer model, this is the relative error, right? And, and time and reducer model plus discrepancy, right? Or, or, or deep learning model, you see that we can get the doubt, the error is almost the same order of magnitude or almost the same as the full order, right? If you do deep learning of purely data driven alone to learn the English problem, you have much higher error, but you know, you learn faster. So you see that? Uh, and this one, the compromise, right? It's a little bit slower than the reducing model, but it's it's, it's much way more accurate, and and that's that's the the the, the, the beauty, right? Okay, so uh, uh, and this is what uh, uh, John and uh, uh, Marvin and Jim and, and their students. Uh, this is a collaboration with them. Uh, I'm not going to go into this problem. I, I don't know much about it. It's just the uh, neutron transport, six dimension problem. Just give you an example. I'm not going to go into detail because I don't know. I think John, I think I saw him going. Maybe if you ask a question, John can answer the question. Uh, but the keys here, again, similarly, right? If you run alone, alone right, you can have a, a high an error. But you use, uh, you can correct the, the ROM with, with deep learning. Right, depends on dimension, and this is another beauty of, of doing this. Right, we know that reducing the model uh, can make an error, but this approach, right, our the approach that we 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 doing here, say that okay, you can make a very large error in the reducing the model by using a few reduced bases, right, and then let the deep learning to learn, and yet you still can get pretty good, right. Of course, it cannot be better than than if you make the ROM better. In other words. You can improve, you can make it more accurate, or you can make it significantly more accurate, depends on your ability to do reducing a model. Okay. Um, so the, the technical message for the second approach that we uh, have been talking is that we want to combine right, the physics that contained by the traditional approach, in this case, reducing a model. And we, at the same time, we still be as fast as reducing the model. We don't want it to way more uh, slower than, than reducing the model. And in order to do that, we actually just very, very simple idea, just take the deep learning to learn. But of course, you have to tweak that there, right? You just simply learn uh, the error, you may have problem. But if you if you actually, you error in the indicator or error estimator, and again, this is a beauty to, to view the traditional applied mathematical uh, approach to improve or to adapt deep learning for the purpose of science and engineering applications. And I, show, I have shown you that it's our form, the data, purely data-driven approach. And, and that's that's the main message for for the second approach. Okay, the third one, model constraint deep learning approach. This session have no results. So my student high is still working on numerical result, but I'm going to share you some idea, right? By the way, on the thought I'm, uh, on the thing that I'm showing you here, either put a PN paper or an archive. So let me know if you're interested, and I can send you uh, the, uh, the the appropriate uh, references. Now recall. Recall this this naive approach in which you want to learn the inverse map directly, right? 
And remember that we actually do regularization, simple regularization for the weight and biases. Okay, so now we're not gonna do it. You know, we're not gonna regularize this way. We're gonna say, we're gonna regularize in a very, very, very different way. We use physics here. Uh, what, what do we mean by that? We want the inverse map, right? This is deep learning to take the observation to the, uh, uh, to the data. We want it such, in such a way that when it returns the, the parameter and when we push the, the push the parameter through the forward, this is the true underlying forward my mathematical problem. When we push it through the forward underlying forward map, we want to recover the data, right? So you think that this is the, uh, the two different one is like, you can, you can think it's a physics, uh, right? A model constraints, a uh, deep learning or, you know, physics, you know, if you want to please it inform. I know George actually gave a talk a few there months ago or so. If you want to physically inform, yes, this is a kind of physically informed regularization, right? You can think that way. Um, and what do we get for, for that case? What is the difference? You already see the solution that I saw you before. Now, for linear inverse problem, linear ne uh, neural net, what do we get for this case? So, of course, you can write out, everybody can do it, but, uh, but the, the key is this, the key is this. When you actually, when you actually plug in to find out the, the solution of deep learning, we call MC model constraint deep learning in this case, it is, in fact, a solution of the uh, uh, regularized linear inverse problem. In other words, now we have we can interpret right um, um, the the solution of deep learning due to the physics right so the beauty of deep, that physics term is allow us to actually understand the you know, machine learning or deep learning solution better and we can show at least for linear case it is nothing more than the realized solution of the traditional approach right so that equivalent so so that's actually we, we feel, feel very happy of course for nonlinear. We don't know, but for linear, you can see the, the, the immediate connection between the model constraint approach and the traditional approach here. All right, so uh, of course, if we can do for the learning the forward map, inverse map directly, you can do for the auto encoder technology that I showed you before as well, right? So uh, as you see that this is the, this is, these two terms you saw previously, that this is the new term, which is the model constraint. We want the, the auto encoders, right, after you get it, Right, you, you just solve for the solutions, right? Whatever the map it is, when it goes through the forward map, it must match the data. So that's, that, that's what we want. And this is the physics uh, uh, based term. Okay. Um, and uh, we, can, we, can, we can prove a couple of things again for linear problem. For nonlinear, we don't know how to do it. We, we can show that for that, that the, the decoder or a model constrained decoder system for linear inverse problem and linear neural network, we can show that, okay, the, the encoder weights is in fact, the, the true forward map, it's interesting, right? And the decoder is a, the left inverse of the, the forward map, which is what we want it to be. We, we want to, we expect it that way, right? Because remember that the encoder try to learn the, the forward map and the decoder try to learn the inverse map. Uh, and what is it, uh, this may not be really important, but this is actually more, you know, this is how you interpret the, the solution. If you, we define that the an inverse block solution, if you get a solution from any method, we define that is a, a equivalent solutions right? or the solution is equivalent to the true underlying parameter if you put the true parameter through the forward map and you put your solution whatever the method that you, that you have through the forward map they match that's what we call equivalent inverse solutions and the, the beauty is that the mc or model constraint decoder inverse solution is an equivalent one right so in, in the sense it's actually behaved like the, the true underlying uh, parameters Okay, so that's a, that's a, a that's a, that's a, a something that I want to share. Of course, right? Uh, we can you can also do MC encoder, which I don't have time to to talk about here. Uh, I'm gonna I'll move forward. But the technical message here is that we use we use the mathematical underlying mathematical model to to train to realize the the new network. And you can show for the MC encoder, you get an equivalent inverse uh, solution for the MC encoder, which I don't don't show here. You get a consistent solutions. So, so um, and with, with that, that physics term, you cannot actually talk about these. Um, okay, so like I said, we don't have the, uh, the uh, numerical result yet. Actually, we do have, but not, not substantially or uh, enough for me to show. Uh, let me go to the last attempt uh, on the statistical approach. Uh, John Su, how, how many more minutes do we have? It was yeah. three, now it's only two. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> you, you, don't you have enough. Here. You have I'm not sure how well, how well I'm doing with at least one of those, so it's more like two. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I I have not gotten an update from her um, lately. I think. I'm sorry, somebody say something. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, Nathan, if I don't know if you're talking. Okay. And anyway, you have enough time. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought that we have only, I have only two minutes, but whoever per person say, I thought I have two minutes. <laughs> I would say, okay, you didn't account at the time that we, 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 we lost a few minutes uh, at the beginning. Anyway, no, so, no, uh, we have enough time. We have enough time. So uh, I, I'm going to uh, go through this. Um, not quick, right? I, I don't like doing things quickly, but I can, I may skip some slides. All right. Now let us recall the model constraint. Remember that we start with a purely, purely data ribbon, and then we have a model constraint. What is the model constraint does? It, it's encoded the, the, the underlying mathematical model as a regularization, right? Question how to choose alpha. Um, okay, so if we actually look thing a little bit more uh, uh, closely, right? If you saw inverse problem before, this is sound like a misfit problem, right? This is a misfit term. The misfit term should actually scale by the, the noise uh, uh, covariance, right? And if you look at this term, it looks more like the, the prior term, right? Because u minus something, right? The prior term, you should regularize here as well. You should put the correct norm here as well, because if not, we may have problem. And finally, right? Remember that phi is the, the, uh, the map from the observation to the parameter, right? And we don't want, we want, we don't want the parameter to behave wildly, right? If you do inverse problem before, we, we, we only restrict the, the, the the solution in some sense, Tikhonov restrict it in the sense that you are close to some predetermined values in some particular norm, right? For the Bayesian inverse problem, we know that the, the correct weighted norm is the covariant, inverse of the covariance, okay? So uh, so this is the first one just to do, to compare with the naive one, but uh, we come back, we stand back and say, okay, how about this? We want to do something more, you know, um, uh, reverse in a sense that it's taken into account the inverse problem. What, what should these things, is it a correct way, right? And of course, it's easily the natural thing that we should do to put the uh, covariance of the inverse of covariance here. And we also need to, 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 um, to um, enforce the growth, right? You don't want the, solu the inverse solution to grow. So that, that's the natural thing to do. But is, is it good? And, and you know, uh, intuitively and, 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 and the way that I just show, I show you, right, it's, it's, it's a natural to do so, but, but, but can actually we get some from some mathematical model? And here we go. It's interesting that it's, it's heuristic argument here that I just show you uh, can actually obtain from a more rigorous model. And, and this is what I'm going to try to talk next, right? Uh, and, and this is the model constraint variation or out encoder. We're not going to use the out encoder at a usual way, right? Uh, if you do out encoder, you know, and you do variational, uh, you know as well. This is not what we do. We actually we try to put the, the the underlying mathematical model inside the variational encoder. How do we do it? Here we go. We assume that the posterior. I I, I apologize uh, um, for those who actually uh, don't know English problem before. Right? I didn't have time to introduce English problem, but uh, um, you know, let me just quickly to to tell you what it means. Right? The posterior is the solution of English problem. It's just the probability density. Right? So please. Uh, bear with me on that, accept that fact. So, and that is only expensive to deal with. Like I mentioned before, the cost of dimensionality, how do you deal with that? Because each uh, time you do a sample of the posterior to see inside the posterior, you require to solve the forward map, the forward equation, which is expensive. So the whole, you know, the whole thing behind the Bayesian English problem is how to cut down the cost of sampling or to explore the posterior, right? Without solving the many, so much the forward problem. That's that's only the key behind the scene, how you can do it. So in this case, we're gonna use variation variation approach. If you know variation approach, the idea is to approximate the posterior with some distribution, right? And the distribution is parameter parameterized by some parameter. We're gonna talk about the parameter later. For now, don't worry about the parameters. One of the one who wish to file parameters such that our approximate uh, uh, Bayesian or you know posteriors is close to the true posterior in some sense. What, what do we mean by in some sense? Here, we're not gonna yield the traditional. So this is the traditional KL diversion. So if you take alpha equal to uh, to uh, one, yes, yeah, alpha equal to one, you get the traditional uh, KL, right? Or variation approach. We, we don't do that. We look at the a more uh, a generic um, um, functional. In, in this case, it's actually called alpha diversion. And you see that's so Jensen's, right? This is basically a Jensen's Shannon. If alpha uh, equal to one half, this is nothing more than the Jensen and, and Shannon uh, diversions, 
okay? So uh, this is an additional term, and this term you see is expensive, right? Because the posterior is here. This is the, um, the approximate posterior, which is much uh, cheaper. All right, so uh, that's a starting point. And if you know a variational approach, it's only try to find an upper bound, right? And try to find a computable upper bound and try to minimize the upper bound instead of minimizing this functional because it's too expensive. And it's, it's, it's easy for, you for um, you know, when I say it's easy, you know, it's just algebra, it's not difficult. You can show, right? You can show that the junctions, uh, Shannon here, diversion plus this term, the KO diversion between the approximate posterior and the posterior is let about it above by these three terms, right? And uh, of course, you know, right? You you know that the 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 lower bound is actually equal to zero when the posterior, the approximate posterior is equal to posterior for both both of the terms. So instead of minimize this, we're gonna minimize the upper bound. So that's that's the key idea. So we minimize the upper, upper bound. We have two, three terms to to deal with, and I put the color on purpose in here, right? Uh, so we had the approximate posterior here that we have to deal with, and we had the posterior. So um, the question is, like, what is the what is the approximate posterior? What is the suitable form, right? Because as soon as we find a suitable form or computable form of the approximate posterior, you can actually can compute the last two term because the last two term depends on only on the approximate posterior and the likelihood on the prior, not the posterior itself. But the latter, the first term is actually more difficult because it is the KL diversion of the true versus the the the, the approximate. Okay, how how are we gonna how are we gonna do it? So we're gonna do it in, in one shot. They are actually the question are separate, but uh, if you address if you address the question on on the approximate posterior, it turns out that you can also address the question of how to approximate the first term as well. And and this is what I'm gonna show you. All right. Now uh, remember that that these are the uh, approximate posterior. What we're gonna do here, like traditional variation approach, we're gonna we're gonna assume that we're gonna learn the the uh, the, the, the the Gaussian distribution. The difference, the difference is that on the traditional, traditional variation approach is that the posterior mean, approximate posterior mean and, and the covariance is actually given by the deep neural net, right? The deep neural net taken uh, the observations, right, and weights and returns the, the approximate posterior mean and the covariance. So that's that the, that's the, 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 the parameter. Remember that I mentioned that the the, this actually family depend on some parameter. What are they? What are this parameter? It's actually nothing more than the, than the weight and biases of the neural network, right? So, so that's answer the question if you have uh, before, in, in your mind. Anyway, if you have a question, please stop me. Now, uh, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna train. Right, as soon as we can train this uh, map, we can learn the the posterior uh, approximate mean and and the approximate covariance, and therefore the the approximate posterior. And if you know the approximate posterior, you can evaluate these two terms, right, uh, cheaply. So how do we do it? We just simply take, we draw samples. We draw samples from the prior. If you do an Bayesian uh, um, inverse problem, we only assume, we make a very strong assumption that drawing from the prior is only easy, okay? In code, it may not be easy. All right, and then when you have the draw, you pass it through the forward map and add some noise, or, or even because this is synthetic data, right? So we add some noise, we get observation. That's how we get the, the training point. Okay, so we we gonna so basically the, the this task is 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 what the training of this the the training task is nothing more than learning from n t inverse problem, right? Because because this is the map from the observation the, from the parameter to observation. So we assume that we have an analytically or synthetic uh, inverse pair the parameter to observation, and we want to learn the map, right? We want to learn uh, the map between these by by training. All right, uh, that's that's not uh, uh, a surprise. Now, the first term it turns out the first term actually can can approximate as well. We should do one more approximations first. You see that the 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 last the first term, which is this one, is, is bothering because it's is the expectation with respect to the posterior, the true one, which is expensive, which I to avoid. It's, it, the beauty here is that if you replace the posterior with the with the prior, right? Um, actually, before doing that, sorry, I'm gonna do one more step. I'm gonna decompose, right? The posterior into the um, uh, uh, the, the ratio into th th these two terms, right? Because we know lock is a negative. That's not a surprise. And this is actually not zero. We actually cross that out because it does not depend on the parameter phi, right? No, remember that we do minimization with respect to uh, to phi here. So this does not depend on phi, so it's not a, a problem. Now, this terms, uh, the only problem with the posterior, what we're gonna do is that we, 
we're gonna replace we're gonna replace the posterior with the, the prior and interestingly we got we got an upper bound okay and uh, and it's, it's consistent with the variation variation approach as soon as you go to upper bound and upper bound and then you might minimize upper bound uh, you know in a sense intuitively it should be good right you don't want to minimize the, uh, the low bound though right so you minimize the upper bound so with this new upper bound we completely independent of the posterior and what we don't want to do is that we, we want to do a very very uh, bad approximation we use only one sample right only approximately this some one samples and it's actually quite well known that in variation approach one sample is, is is pretty good right you can do more but for us the result that we're going to show you later we use only one sample all right now I'm going to put things, everything together, everything together. Remember that we approximate uh, these two terms by a Gaussian and through the deep neural net, and we, we, we approximate with this one with the upper bound and we minimize, right? Remember that? So, so now our problem, our problem when we put thing, all these things together, our problem now that looked like this is the minimize of, of, of three terms. And this interestingly, uh, very look very familiar with what we did before with heuristic, right? MC DNN. The her heuristically, we want to learn the map from the observation to the parameter. Remember that this is a different net, right? And we add the uh, physics term here, and and remember that we want the the uh, the, the the solution must be bound in some some uh, some respected norm. And we did it heuristically, but this framework automatically 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 give us the two. So in other words, you can think about this framework actually give us a justification of what we did before, right? What we did before is just heuristic, which actually what we did before, we didn't, we never know. But later on, when we look at this framework, somehow it's recover, which make us very happy. Okay. Now I'll give you a couple of examples and let me end the talk. Uh, if it's uh, Jonsu, Jonsu, is that one minute left, zero minute left? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you have a time, please. Okay. Please. Okay. So, um, um, so this is in, in, in a way, I'm, I'm gonna make things a little bit more visually for you here, right? We, we start from observation, we go through we, we go through a deep neural net. Remember that deep neural net take the observation and return the approximate posterior mean and the covariance, right? At the top, if you have this, you can draw assembles, right? And uh, from, from the approximate posterior and you pass it through the, the forward map, right? So this, this, is the, this is the home process that you can see. So, the, this part of the, the process corresponding to do minimization of this, right? And this part of the process is to mi do minimization of the physics term here. So unlike the, the uh, traditional variation of uh, outer encoder, our approach actually have the, the physics term here by going through the uh, junction uh, chain. And, okay, of course, uh, you may ask, you know, can you actually prove something about it? And as always, right? We, we are engineer. <laughs> But we do apply math research. So whenever the beauty of being an engineer, all right, is that whenever we can prove something, we go, uh, we prove. Otherwise, we just go ahead and, and go without in intuition. And that's the reason why we had the MCDNN before, right? It's just based on our in in intuition. Now, let me simplify and see whether we can prove something. Again, linear inverse problem, that's the key. Linear inverse problem, linear net neural network, you can prove something uh, uh, interestingly, right? Um, if you assume that is the case, uh, don't forget about the detail. Will look complicated, but it's not. Believe me, it's a linear algebra. But the key is this: the key is this box. If you if you work with the linear inverse problem, you can show that our framework returned approximate posterior, which is exactly the true posterior mean. Right? The approximate posterior mean is the true posterior mean, and the approximate posterior covariance, covariance is in fact the true posterior covariance for the linear inverse problem. Okay, so of course, this is an inverse problem. Uh, you can do a lot of things. The, the key thing is that it gives us the, the confidence that the, this approach is, is good, right? Because if, you know, for linear, whatever the method that you develop, if it cannot work for linear inverse problem or linear problem, then there's no hope to work for uh, non-linear. That's not, not my opinion, right? Of course, uh, each of us have different opinion. Uh, just to tell you why I, I do linear one, just a you know, sanity check in the thing in that way. Of course, you can, you can, you don't need to do the, the, remember that this is the physics term. If you want to do pure data driven, you still can work with our framework and just do pure data driven here, right? To replace the deeper net here instead of the, the, the forward map. All right. So that could give you an example here to see the results. Perhaps let me show you the training process a little bit. This is the training process. Um, so this is the, the posterior mean, and this is the approximate posterior mean that the training go, go, uh, go through. There's a 
it's clip in between. It's not the, the 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 actual thing, right? Don't worry. So you see that? No, that that one is not. For some reason, the movie is not uh, doing well. My postdoc say so. Uh, some reason it's just flip back. It's not the 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 uh, the the true numerical result, right? It's just the artifact of the uh, movie. Okay. Anyway, the key is that you can see as the as you number e pass go through, you get closer closer to the the true um, uh, posterior mean, and you also have a quantification of uncertainty here. And this is not linear inverse problem, of course, right? Not not linear problem. Okay, but I'm not going to go into details here. Uh, we only see movie. Let's actually move to next uh, um, um, uh, examples. And uh, uh, in fact, should I say, okay, let's actually skip this slide. It's not important. Um, you can actually increase. We actually, we learn, um, we try to see whether, you know, we, you increase the, the day training data. We, we look at a different noisy, you see how it works. And it, the, the result is quite robust, as you can see, right? It's, it's similar to what you've seen before. So uh, let me skip the uh, detail of the numerical. Hopefully you can see something already. The, the main message for, for the last part of the talk is the uh, model constraint variation approach. This is another approach that we try to do. Um, we learned the mean and the, and, and the point Y covariance of the, the posterior. And uh, we have seen that if you if you equip the physics, you can show, right? At, at least your, your result actually can be interpretable, right? At least for the linear case that you can learn the posterior exactly. Um, all right. And, and for this case, right, remember that I have two approach, purely data driven and, 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 and the, the uh, deep learning, um, right, physical form, we can think that way. Uh, they, they don't actually very different. They don't, they don't look very different. So we still don't understand why, yet we still work on that. It does not seem to outperform the purely data driven, but the, the problem is too, too easy. Uh, that, that's what Albert gets, but we're not sure. All right, so we have been working on uh, various aspects of, of um, um, Deep learning for science and engineering problem. Let, let me show you a, a couple of movie. This is, you know, you will try to learn the, the forward map. It's a way propagations for difference, right? You different, in, not initial gap forcing term. You can just learn and then see whether you can predict the, um, the solution of the way propagation for different source. And you see that, you know, by at least by Ibor norm, it's, it's worked very well. The new network solution is here. It looks very similar. Okay. Uh, just and this is the, the 3D inverse wave propagation, the earthquake problem that I showed you before, right? This is the error between the the deeper net, which is um, um, which is the uh, uh, this one, right? And the true solution inverse solution for 3D uh, sinus wave inverse problem here. You see that we, we do pretty well. Not I didn't have time to go through. We also look at very hybrid elasticity nonlinear problems. Uh, and what I showed you here is that the final element solution is in the red points, and the neural network prediction is a blue uh, wireframe. You cannot distinguish on the eye uh, on, on by eye, right? Um, of course, uh, this because we encode the physics in there, and the error is actually five percent the I on average. All right, so uh, we also thought we learned we we working on uncertainty quantification for deep learning. That, that's actually the key, right? How do you know that deep learning is good? So um, let let not me not go into details. I just wanted to tell you that we have some result here to show that not only we can predict, but beyond the, the solution of neural network, but also we can predict the, the error, right? And this actually, this is the, 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 the NIPS um, classification number of problems. And, uh, and um, you know, the, the, the true one actually is, is two, right? The, the, the true number is actually two. And you can see that the error is very small, the very, very small. The rest is actually, the error is actually big somewhere else, right? Because we, we, we can predict, we can estimate that the, the uncertainty is small there, right? which is makes sense. All right, so uh, uh, I'm not gonna go into details, but I'm just trying to say that we have been making a few efforts to encode the underlying mathematical model into the deep learning. The reason we do so, not just we wanna do it, it's just because the data is limited. And when we first tried the purely data driven, it does not give us, you know, an explanation what what does it, what actually what it, it does, right? It's, it's just a, a, a home complicated uh, formulation, but it's not clear what it's going to do. Uh, for physics, right? Or you if you encode or you put the model inside the training, it turns out that you can do a few things. Right? At least you can prove a few things that, and and your result looks uh, meaningful in terms of the like close to the traditional mathematical approach. But you know you are much faster than using a traditional mathematical approach. All right, so I think I should stop now.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Tan. Uh, it was uh, wonderful. I, I liked it uh, a lot. Um, so um, now let's move on to Q&A session. There was uh, one question from Ryan, but uh, between Colin and Ryan, uh, I guess the question has been sorted out. So um, <laughs> without, without in, um, you know, inter in, in, intervene uh, from, from the speaker, uh, but that's great. Uh, that means uh, a lot of interest from the audience. So if you have any questions, you can put that question in the, uh, the chat room or you can unmute yourself and then uh, directly ask, ask the questions, okay? I'd ask a question. Uh, is it Ryan? Yes. Yep. Yeah, so, so I'm just curious. Um, so so I, I, I'm interested if, if one was, for example, to solve, um, solve a problem with machine learning versus just doing pure Bayesian uh, UQ, uh, is there pros and cons between that? Or are they just sort of like different tools to solve a problem? Yeah, so uh, if you do the traditional Bayesian approach, it is expensive. So the more main idea is, is that to cut out the cost of the, the solving Bayesian inverse problem, especially those who actually governed by PDEs. If you have a PDE behind the scene, that's, that's a problem. Um, so what we have been trying to do is to try to learn the inverse map directly or the forward and then use it to, to do faster inverse solutions. So the, the, the pro is, which we hope is actually faster, but we don't want to make error fast, right? Because now we do approximation, we may make error compared to the traditional inverse pro, uh, Bayesian inverse problem. So the idea is to, to not make fast error or to make error so fast uh, is from our point of view is to encode the, the underlying mathematical model in there. Um, we haven't have done actually extensive uh, solution. In fact, we're gonna show, we, we have here, let me actually uh, show you. I didn't have time to go into details. I know that it was, I think, over time. Um, the accuracy is comparable, but uh, more rigorous and more extensive comparison should be done, which we are doing right now. So this is actually not even the traditional Bayesian inverse problem. This is just a Gaussian approximation of the, the Bayesians um, posteriors, right? And then, and then you take the Gaussian covariance as the measurement of the, the, the error. So we, we think that we, we get a comparable thing, at least for the Gaussian approximations, but the, the true posterior and the, the true uncertainty required by, you know, Samlin, for example, by MCMC and compare again this, uh, we haven't done it yet. Uh, so in, in, in summary, um, it could be faster, but uh, whether it's, it's more accurate or it's still not more accurate, I don't think so, right? But it is, can it still have some, you know, uh, appropriate uh, equivalence um, accuracy that that's still uh, in, in research, at least numerically by eyeball norm, you can think that you, you can say that they are similar, but theoretically, we don't know. Yeah, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. On that vein, I, I'd also be interested. So, like, if you if you're doing this for like, let's say, time dependent PDE, and you had uh, data up to some uh, on some time interval, and then you wanted to, uh, you know, do your machine learning, and then wanted to pro to create like, let's say, a um, band of uncertainty in time uh, for that. Uh, you know, obviously, you could do that with the Bayesian perspective, but I'm like sort of curious, you know. Uh, I know, like, this is kind of a big problem with machine learning models when trying to extrapolate um, things get tough. So, so I guess I, 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 I sort of feel like that's like why a lot of people in the UQ community like the Bayesian perspective because you can get that band of uncertainty. Um, can can you get that in machine learning and have some idea of how well this is, or if it's just bad? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's that's actually a great question, Ryan. Here, actually, actually, I show you here. Okay, first. That let me actually address the question in extrapolation, right? Uh, in fact, uh, that's the, the key thing, right? That if you try to extrapolate, if you use machine learning in an extrapolation regime, it's going to be bad, right? The idea of machine learning is not about extrapolation, but interpolation in a sense. Um, so we try to avoid that. And how do we actually, at least one way to avoid extrapolation is to encode the mathematical underlying uh, in there, ma mathematical underlying model in there, right? The physics term that I showed you before. So the machine learning try to interpolate the data, but also interpolate the mathematical model. 
right? So that that, that that's actually your question is so great that I, I didn't have a chance to mention about that. Um, so it's, it's try to circumvent that, that situation. Secondly, with this variational, right, model, model constraint variation approach, we actually can 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 also estimate uncertainty, which is the band here. So these are the result from from the um, um, uh, machine learning approach that we we we, we develop here. We we not only get the solution, which is the mean here, right? The the black is the, the is approximate solution mean, and this is the true underlying one. But but we also actually can can talk about uncertainty here. Yes, we can. The, we can estimate uncertainty. How good it is, it needs to be a, a further study. But but we can, and it lies similar to the Bayesian approach. Okay. Well, th thank you, uh, Tan. Uh, the next question is from Rahul. Uh, he asked, um, have nonlinear neural net uh, variants been tested for the auto um, inversion model? Say again one more time, uh, uh, Yong, Yong Su. Has, yeah, uh, he asked, uh, have nonlinear neural network variants been tested for the auto inversion model? So I, I, I mean. Okay. Um, okay, let me go back to that slide. Okay, so. Variance, remember that the auto inversion thing that I, I did before, that's a deterministic thing, okay? So uh, we don't have, we have the results, which I, I show you here, but it's just, it's just a deterministic results um, because the traditional auto encoder is a deterministic way. So it cannot estimate uncertainty or variance, uh, at least the way that we use right now. And uh, how do we do, how we actually estimate the variance if, I'm trying to answer the question. I'm not sure whether that's what you're asking for. You know, if you if you don't mind, please just you know turn on a video uh, to, to to a microphone and ask the question again, perhaps. But this approach is a deterministic, so it does not give an, a, a variance, right? As opposed to the variational approach that I, I show you in the last few minutes, where we actually not only predict the solution but also the variance. Does that okay? Uh, does does it answer your question, Rahul? Uh, if you are around, maybe it's not. Um, yeah, maybe uh, maybe it's not. Okay. Um, so I I don't see any more questions from the you know the chat box, but uh, um, I I do have some questions. Um, when you uh, train the auto encoder, for example, mm -hmm. uh, what what sort of the convergence rate rate do you observe? Um, how fast it is and how slow they are, et cetera. Can you comment on that? The training process. Yeah, training of the autoencoder. <laughs> so, okay, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I, I wish that my postdoc is here. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know, actually, I don't know the details. Uh, sorry see. about that, I cannot uh, answer that question. <laughs> All right, that's but fine. It's typically very slow. I mean, I did see the general thing, right? And that's, yeah. that's a problem with, with the machine learning approach. And, and, and actually that your question is that lead to uh, the important point because the machine learning, if you train, you spend a lot of time and if you just afford, solve a forward problem, it's not worth it, right? The machine learning techniques, at least for PDE type of problem, it's useful when you do forward problem, forward propagation uncertainty where you need to solve the forward many times, right? Or you solve the inverse problems, right? Um, um, many times or, or you know, you need to evaluate the forward problem many times. Then, then this exactly. that becomes uh, useful because English problem itself is very expensive. It's only useful or only from from my point of view to do machine learning if you solve big kind of problems. Because otherwise, training takes a lot of time. You see, generate a lot of data, and you learn. If you do machine learning, you know before. If you learn, you know, it's just a standard stochastic gradient descent or Adams. And with many parts, it's just it's run for can be forever. It depends on also your network architecture as well. By the way, I didn't talk about that. We also do research on architecture design because how many neurons, how many uh, layers, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's always a top top question. The more yeah. layer that you have, more unit that you have, it takes much longer time to, to train. It's it's yeah. Uh, gen generic answer to you is very slow. <laughs> how slow? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so follow on my, my question, uh, the Rahul asked um, this question, mm -hmm. how much computational cost does the trained model offset as compared to the full order model? So I, I, I guess you don't have a Good. detailed answer because you, you don't have a postdoc with you. Yeah, <laughs> Good if, question. You, if, if you can comment on that. Good, good question. Good question. I think uh, I at least let me actually show you maybe back to the uh, re 
only the reducer model actually we actually uh you know recorded the thing right the other one we didn't mm -hmm. record we again let, let me just make sure that that um is thing clear right this is just an attempt that we're doing we, we just see whether we can recover solution in some sense okay um so we haven't actually made an effort to to measure or is it worth or it's more than upset the the solution of traditional or the training um uh, uh cost okay so even this we actually didn't actually compare or we didn't actually put the training class here. Uh, I wish that my student uh, is here. But, you know, thinking about this, thinking about if you need to solve inverse problem many times, you know, this is what you get for the, um, poor, this is a very small problem. You don't see much of the, the game, but uh, it's like more less than half, right? If you solve the problem many times and, uh, and, uh, and of course, <laughs> if this actually uh, more than offset the the time that you do training, then it's worth it. Right? Otherwise, it's not worth it. I agree. So uh, I, I the, the the question is very important, but unfortunately, we haven't actually spent time doing you know the real rigorous record of all the things to see whether it's actually good in terms of timing or not. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, so I I have another question. If you go to the Please. previous slide, the the slide twenty three. Okay. Um and. Sorry. Yeah, so there, um, so do you, you combine the deep learning with the reduced student model and in terms of reduced student model, you introduce the fee here in, inside of the residual term, right? I, I guess this fee is your reduced basis, right? Yeah, this is reduced basis, yes. And, and there are many ways of constructing this reduced basis. So how, how do you construct it? Oh yeah, that, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, more than reduced model. Like, uh, Question now, okay. So we, we do it in, in a model constraint way as well, uh, um, as Jong Su. So we we do a greedy approach. We uh, we minimize the error between the reduced and the full models. Thinking about this, right? This is the the reduced model. Forget about the pseudo here. This is the reduced model, right? This is a full model. Forget about the regularization term here. We try to find a parameter at which the error between the full model. Let's say that you have a current reduced model with zero basic vectors. How do I find the next basic vectors? Okay, so I, I minimize the error between the full model and the reduced model. You find a parameter. I'm sorry, not minimize, maximize. Basically, I I want to find in the parameter space, right? At which parameter our reduced model is the worst? Okay, and then I take that parameter, I solve the forward solution, and I get that into the basis. And I I I I, I construct a new reduced model with that enriched basis, and then I do it again and again. Right. For the new See. reducer model, you maximize the error between the full and reduce, right? To find a parameter in the worst case scenario um, um, parameters, and then take the solution at that worst case scenario parameter into your basis. Right. By doing that, you can see, right? You can, maybe you're thinking about the error surface. We try to find in the error surface which one is the maximum and bring the maximum error down in the error surface between the reducer model and the full model. Right, right. Okay, so so there also the issue of the curse of dimensionality. If you have a um, the high dimension in your parameter space, then the number of um, the samples you have to include in your greedy algorithm. Sure, 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 in sure, sure. Increasing exponentially. Yeah, yeah. But here's the beauty. Actually, um, it's, it's, it could be right. Depends on how you use it. Um, mm -hmm. We actually rely on the optimization in high dimensional space for sure is difficult, right? But if you do PDE, it turns out, right? Actually, I think it actually can be improved that if you use Newton type of technique, we would, which we do, Newton type of optimization technique with trust region, what we do behind the scene, the trust region, Newton CG, you can show that actually the the number of iteration is actually independent of the, of the, the, the parameter dimensions as soon okay. as you resolve the physics, okay? Of course, if you go from two and to, to 10 parameters, right? You refine the mesh, the, 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 the dimension, the parameter dictated by the mesh, of the parameter mesh. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't prove it, but, uh, but I, I, I have the result to show you, uh, but don't, I don't have it here. Basically showing that if you refine the mesh to, to a certain point, increase the mesh beyond that, does not increase the, the the cost. Basically, you actually capture on the on the uh, information in the in the data. And with Newton method, the number of parameter number of iterations will be fixed. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Tan. Um, um, is there any other questions? I mean, I I, I have um, another questions uh, on the 
you know, the autoencoder where you map the, from the solution to the parameter and parameter to the solution. Uh -huh. I, I thought that was a pretty interesting idea. Um, but in the, in the context of the time dependent problem, by the, by the way, um, so your parameter does not change uh, with time, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the solution uh, may change throughout the time, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know how you, you know, map those time dependent states with a time independent parameter and then map back to the time dependent uh, mm -hmm. states. Okay. So that's how would you deal with that uh, for the yeah. time dependent problem? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good question, uh, uh, Yun-Su. Uh, the, 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 actually, the idea is still the same. Remember that if you look at, right, remember that we learned the, uh, actually where is the forward map, the F is the forward map. So, okay, so the forward map, what is the forward map? The forward map take the parameter to observation, right? right? Exactly. The, the observation can be in time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in the same, the, 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 um, the um, the forward map actually does not actually see the discretization. It does just see a whole bunch of measurements, right? Uh, for, uh -huh. for the the forward map, it just it's just mathematically a map from the observation uh, to parameter to observation, and observation is a whole bunch of point. And these whole bunch of point is the observation that you make over times. You just collect them onto one big vector, for example, right? I see. So okay. if you collect them into one big vector, this is still the observation, and this is still the parameter, and this is the observations. Okay. Because, because the forward map does not see the, the, the time discretization in there, in a sense. Okay. Okay. So so you, you treat the whole space time solution as a one one um, state solution and then map that to uh, the parameter. Notice that we don't go through the state, uh, John Su. This is important, right? There's no state in here. It's just the observation that and the only the observation. Okay. I and see. the parameters. Right, the state, the state is just the, the mid domain. It's, it's uh, and it's actually uh, go through, and that actually you don't see it because it, it's, it is embedded inside the forward map. The forward yeah. map is mapped yeah. from the parameter Got. to observations. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, um, any other question from the audiences? I'm, I guess I asked too many, too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't see it from the chat room. Um, so, well then, if you don't have uh, any more questions, please let's thank uh, the, the tent. Well, we had like in, like in the middle of the talk. Rahul, Rahul, said, Rahul said that he have quite a few questions. Rahul. Oh, Rahul. Uh, please, yeah, please email me, okay? We, 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 can, we can chat by email or, you know, we can meet uh, in, in, you know, personal or uh, in private. Yeah, yeah that, that'll be awesome. I mean, that's, that's what this is, seminar. Uh, is for. Um, okay, wonderful. All right, uh, let's thank uh, our speaker, um, uh, Professor Tan Bui. Um, it was wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. And I hope uh, I, I really, uh, I do think that the audiences uh, enjoyed it uh, a lot too. Um, thank you so much for the great talk. And I hope that this is the starting point of the, the future collaboration uh, between Lawrence Livermore and other external uh, audiences with uh, uh, the TAND uh, from UT Austin. And uh, uh, yes, I mean, um, thank you so much, TAND, uh, for the great talk. And thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch, right? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for the opportunity. I, I really enjoy talking uh, to all of you. All Take right. Take care. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye now. Bye. Hey, Tan, if you can send send the PDF version. Um, oh yeah, sure, 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 and, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I will do it. I will do it. Excluding the uh, the yeah, movie. I, mean, yeah. can... I will do it. I will do it after this. Okay. okay. I'll talk to you later. Bye.